As you know, this was the break we already had. So the next speaker is Dr. Eric Liu, who is the person who taught me to wear T-shirts. Uh, let's see if he has a T-shirt on today. No, disappointment. Oh, boo. Or is that a T-shirt? Smaller than it used to be. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. His, his old T-shirt would have counted as two T-shirts for me. Yeah. Uh, one for each leg. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So Eric's going to talk about somatostatin analogs, and specifically of the commercially available somatostatin analogs. Which one should you use? When should you uh, switch? And what do we know about? all the different ways to give analogs. OK, so I'm not wearing a t-shirt because it is freezing in this room, right? <laughs> right? I mean, uh, right? I told Marianne and Bob, I think they should have sold 1,000 blankets, and they would have made like $10,000, you know, $10, my gosh. So, uh, but I'm wearing this sweatshirt. So this sweatshirt has the Healing Net Foundation on it. So if you guys want one, they're $10,000 a piece now. <laughs> But I am wearing a t-shirt, so let's see what t-shirts I had to dress in layers, you know. So here's one, right? Dun, 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 dun. So most people probably aren't from New Orleans, so I'll just say that the Saints suck. That's the first one. Oh, hold on. I'm from Washington, D.C., so it's okay. I'm suffering. But I live in Denver. I live in Denver. It's okay. But I did wear a classic throw, uh, throwback Seacan t-shirt today. Hello, Seacan t-shirt. So that's in support of the Wayman family and all they've done for the past many, many years. And so it's very exciting, and I'm delighted to be here. So my job is to um, talk about somatostatin analogs. And, and I will, because it's hard. And it's, it's actually a, a great problem to have. And so we'll kind of discuss this. But I got to tell you. So I was sitting in the back there listening to Dr. Wallen. Dr. Wallen sounds super smart, doesn't he? <laughs> he sounds super smart. I am not as smart as Dr. Wallen, so I'm sorry. But we will talk about this. But I will tell you. So he was talking about sequences and the complication, you know, complicated different medicines and all the trials and stuff like that. Let me tell you the first therapy you should have, right? This is the first therapy you should have, right? You should do what? You should cut it out. That's right. That's right. What's the second therapy you should think about? That's right. You should cut it out. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And what's the third therapy you should think about? Right. You should cut the thing out. Right? Because you know what causes a complete response? Surgery causes a complete response. That's kind of a good way of rule of thumb, right? Is it complicated? Sure. Is surgery just one, one tool in the toolbox? Yes. Okay. Now, I have to comment on Dr. Wallen's last statement, too, because he talked about the Indian guys and the elephant. All right. So I'm Chinese, all right? That means I can see the whole elephant. So you should get a doctor who can see the whole elephant. Or even eat the elephant. That's right. I know. You know, a little soy sauce, it tastes really good. <laughs> That's right. I don't eat elephant. I don't eat elephant. So you have your choice. You can either see the, me or Dr. Wang. You got two, two, or Dr. Tang. You got three, three Chinese doctors. All right. So anyway, so I do encourage it. Now, we'll talk about this more tomorrow. But I feel very, now I have learned, I've learned many, many things from Dr. Waltering and Dr. Boudreaux and Dr. Wang. But the thing they taught me the most was that People feel better, people do better, if you can get as much of that junk out of you. And it is absolutely true. I mean, I have been proven uh, not wrong, but, you know, but I have had to be convinced by my patients in the past, please, Dr. Liu, take it out. Please take it out. Please take it out. I'm like, I don't know. So I did it, right? Because you know, I'm an easy, nice guy. And so I finally took it all out, and they felt so much better. And they were right. So you know, lesson one, do what the patient tells you to do. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I have a couple of disclosures, right? So I do work for these companies. So, you know, my job is to talk about the different SMAS that analogs. So I, I work a little for Ipsen. I work a little for Novartis, which means I'm right in the middle, right? So I'm kind of like a purple state. I live in Colorado. So that's how it is. So, so here, let me start with this. This is, this is kind of the, the, the premise of my lecture. This is a picture of my wife. <laughs> what? 
You don't think she'd marry me? <laughs> what? All right, so this is a picture of my wife. Okay, fine. You know, she's been around for a long time. She's beautiful. She's great. She's helped so many people. You know, been, in, been around for 25 years. Just like, awesome, right? And then about a year ago, I met this woman. And I'm just like, well, I tell you, you know, she's pretty attractive too. I don't know. Okay, so do all the women hate me now? Is that the problem? Is that what's going <laughs> So this is kind of the issue that we're dealing with, and that's what I'm going to talk about in this lecture, right? For those of you who don't, does anyone not know who these people are? All right, good. It, this is Katie Couric. Lou. And this is Savannah Guthrie. The, yeah, Lou. <laughs> I hope one of these days. Anyway, so the question is, how do you choose? All right, all right. So I am not. I'm not going to go into all like a lot of figures and stuff. I'm going to make this very, very kind of hopefully easy to digest. So we're going to answer, try to answer a couple questions for well, several questions. So let me talk first about somatostatin because I'm sure there are a few newbies in here, right, who don't know. Right. Okay, so we have a few newbies. So let me just explain what that is. And then I'll talk about what is this octreotide, which is an amazing molecule. I'll talk about lanreotide, which is an even fancier molecule. We'll talk about sanostatin LER. We'll talk about um, this somatuline, somatuline depot, which is lanreotide. We'll talk a little bit about what the clinical trials show, which is why we do what we do. And we'll talk about um, what the FDA has approved and tells us to do. We'll talk about the NCCN recommendations, and the NCCN is the um, National Comprehensive Cancer Network, which is like all the big ivory towers that get together and, and, and talk. And then we'll talk about the different kinds of formulations, because you, the devil's in the details. I'll talk a little bit about the differences in dosing, though it's really very idiosyncratic, as Dr. Wallen said. And then finally, we'll talk about financial support, because none of this is cheap. None of it is cheap, all right? So let me tell you about somatostatin first. So somatostatin is a natural hormone that we all make, okay? It's, uh, somato means uh, body, and statin means stop. So it kind of stops your bodily function. So the analogy I say, it's like having an emergency braking system. You can pull it down. You would hate to have diarrhea when you're being chased by a tiger, right? So you know, your body can throw this off and turn off your endocrine system and shut things down until you cool down. And then once you get away, you can have as much diarrhea as you want, right? It's okay. But that's what somatostatin does. And so we have been very fortunate in our neuroendocrine world to be able to exploit this wonderful tool that was given to us by Mother Nature. And this is no small feat, right? This medication and this, this, this biology and this, this hormone was given the Nobel Prize back in 1977. And it's, uh, it's, it's done actually quite a few things. I think next to maybe insulin, which is truly like a miracle hormone and a miracle medication. Somatostatin has been, is very close to that. In fact, if it wasn't for somatostatin, they would have never been able to synthesize insulin. In fact, they, somatostatin is the first synthetic hormone ever made. It's a great story, you should read it. I, I can, I'll tell you someday, maybe after the comedian's done, but it, it's a great, great story. Um, and so the invention of octreotide, which is the, the molecule we all know, love, n know and love now, is actually really fascinating as well. Because basically what had happened was um, back in the 70s, they discovered the protein, right? And that's the hormone floating around in your body. And then Sandoz, which is kind of the precursor to Novartis, um, said, oh, we've got to study this. We've got to make it. It'll be a great medication. And they tinkered with it for many, many years, and they couldn't quite get it to work. And then in 1978, these really smart scientists in uh, San Diego found that, oh, well, you can use, use a little piece of it and it works better. And Sandoz dumped everything they had done, dumped it, stopped it, and started working on this little guy here. And a year and a half later, they had a molecule called SMS201-995 in 1980. That molecule is octreotide. So let me tell you a story. This is a secondhand story, I'm sorry. But Dr. Odoricio, Everyone knows and loves Dr. Odoricio, right? Yes, of course we do. Where's Odo? So Odo tells me this story, and I, I don't know how much of it's true. Probably none of it's true. <laughs> but he tells me a story. He said when, when octreotide first came out, he, one of his surgeons, I don't know, maybe Dr. Zollinger, I don't know, said, Odo, you got to come help me. This patient is dying of carcinoid crisis. you got to come. So Odo, thankfully 35 years ago, jumps 
uh, goes to the pharmacy and says, I need octreotide because I need to save a patient's life. And the pharmacist says, this is a research drug. I can't just give it to you. So he leaps across the counter, goes in back, grabs the drug, takes it to the OR, and saves the patient's life. Yeah. <laughs> If he had to do that now, I'm pretty sure he would collapse on the table and the patient would have died. That's why you need young doctors. <laughs> okay, so 1980, we had this new, really fantastic drug. I mean, it was really fantastic. And we use it now. So we use it now, and so basically what it is, it's the business end of somatostatin, so the whole emergency braking system, the business end of it, in a very short peptide. So that means that instead of the natural hormone breaking down in two to three minutes, it now can last for four to six hours, right? So now, now you don't need like a continuous infusion of the hormone. You can just give yourself little shots. And those little shots are these guys, too. They're called um, rescue octreotide, right? It's a little water-soluble. You give yourself, it's like a little bee sting kind of thing. You have to do it three, four times a day or you know, however many times you need it. But, it's, but you can get it. It's generic, right? Uh, except for these guys, right? This is by Mylon. You're right, I know. My kid has a peanut allergy. 600 bucks, I got it. No? OK, all right. Anyway, octreotide, however, is a wonderful, wonderful medication. And so just understand that you have it available. It's a great way to get the symptoms under control, um, especially while you're kind of waiting for the big shots to kind of kick in. And I'm sure lots of you are using it in conjunction with your, um, uh, you know, your big shot once a month. But it's been a wonderful tool. It's been a wonderful um, uh, therapy. So then after octreotide came along, a very, very brilliant um, scientist named Dr. David Coy, who actually is literally just down the street from us, a good friend of Dr. Waltering's, developed this interesting, model. he's a peptide chemist, and he said, well, maybe if I tinker with it and do this, and well, in a much more British posh accent, um, tinkered with the molecule and came up with this molecule called lanreotide. And lanreotide is also a, mo a small molecule that also binds into somatostatin analog, the business end of it, but it has really amazing properties. And so he invented that and is now your, it used to be called BIM23014, and it is now your drug called somatuline. Okay, that's what it is now. But they're actually pretty neat. And actually since then, a lot of people have been working on this, including the Europeans. So we have a lot of choices, right? So we have our native somatostatin, right? That's the hormone. Here are our two friends, lanreotide and octreotide. But then you have this guy here too. This is octrea scan. Right? Anyone had an Octrea scan? Yeah, sure. This is what they injected into you, right? This is Dota Toc, right? This is Dr. Oder, the Dr. Odoricio's favorite molecule. This is Dota Tate, right? So PRT and gallium right now is what we're using mostly for this one. So there are quite a few things out there, and we'll talk more about it probably later. So this is basically what happens, right? Give you a sense of this. So on your cell are all these somatostatin receptors, and there are five of them. Okay, there are five of them. And the hormone binds the receptor, and they, you know, they go in, they go out, you know, they, they, but basically it tells the cell to just hush down, quiet. Don't secrete so much hormone, don't grow so fast, just relax, and that's what it does. And so you can see there are a whole bunch of different receptors. And that means that the different peptides bind slightly different to each one, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But that's the principle, that's the concept. All right, so with octreotide, which is our most well-known molecule, it binds mostly to number two, okay? A little bit to three and, and pretty okay to five, but two is kind of the business. So that's the hardest working uh, receptor that we use. And that's the one that we use mostly for uh, like gallium scans and dotatate and for symptom control and all that kind of stuff, right? So that's, that's, that's our workhorse receptor. Now what they did was they, so Novartis was very clever, or Sandoz I guess at the time was very clever, and they said, okay, well I can't, you know, these poor patients, they're giving to themselves every, you know, three times a day. It's a real pain in the derriere. So they said, well, why don't we make a big long-acting version of it so it works better? So what they did is they took the peptide protein, right, the hormone, and they packed it into these tiny, tiny little bubbles, okay, these little polymers. And these little polymers, when it goes into your derriere, right, this is where it goes, you can now slowly release them so it's long-acting. You give it once a month. So that certainly made people's lives much better. And you have to understand, Odo used to tell me, I learned a lot from Odo too. He said there was a time when, when, when VIPoma patients and, and carcinoid patients couldn't be discharged from the hospital for like two years. 
because they would leave and get dehydrated and have so much diarrhea. So this was a very much a life-saving, life, radically life-altering drug. And when they became once a month, I mean, then they could function like real human beings again. So it was, it was a huge change. And it's released over a month, right? So it's very, very slow. But this is actually a picture you can see here. If you get doses of the medication over the course of several months is when the medication actually starts to really stabilize, OK? So I usually tell people, well, it takes about two or three shots before you're really kind of in a good place. So that's kind of how sandostatin works. Now, somatulene is a little bit different, right? It, too, is also long-acting. It, too, is also once a month. And it comes, however, as 60, 90, and 120 milligrams. And it's different because it's a tiny, it's, it's a little peptide. But what they do is they bind together. They crystallize automatically. It's magical. And they form these nanoparticles, like long ribbons. And when they form together, this is Dr. Coy's you know, brilliance here, when they form together these open helical ribbons, they then close down, and then you get, they zipper up, and you get these tiny, tiny little nanoparticles. And that means that you can now pack 120 milligrams worth of that drug, which is a lot. I mean, if you saw 120 milligrams of, of like powder, it looked like a lot, into this tiny little vial of 0 0.5 milli milliliters. And that's why the shot volume is so low, OK? So all these things packed together in a very dense way into these high-density nanoparticles, and then uh, it can go in. So it's a little bit different from Sando because it doesn't have these kind of polymers and these things to kind of hold it together. They naturally hold together. And when it injects, it forms a tiny little bump in your, in your bottom, and it slowly dissolves out over time, right? So that's kind of how it works. So it's a little bit different because it doesn't have to be given in the muscle. It can be, be given in the, just kind of, kind of the fat area of your bottom. So it's a little more forgiving. So that, those are the two drugs. And somatulin here, you can see here, it's the same type of thing. You get kind of a little burst release, right? So the little hormones that are, that are not bound release out. And then over the next course of the month, you get a nice smooth and steady release of the drug. So that's Sando, and that's somatulin, and that's kind of how they work. So now, what did the clinical study show? Just to give you a sense of it. Well, really, sandostatin came out you know, many years ago, and it was to help symptom control. And it was great. I mean, this was approved like with just a handful of patients. So if you looked at the 5-HIAA, right, which is the serotonin breakdown product, you probably pee into a jug. We measure it all the time. If you started taking sandostatin who had, in people who had really bad disease, it would go down by 50%, right? And then if you ask the patients about their symptoms, how's your flushing? Well, it went down by 80% with sandostatin. And how's your diarrhea? It went down 40% with the sandostatin. I mean, if we had you know, drugs that would do this, this would be a billion dollar drug, right? I mean, this is amazing, these results. Well, this is actually a $27 billion drug, right? So this, is, this has helped a lot. And you know what? Worth every penny. Worth every penny. It's helped so many people, all right? Somatulene is very similar, right? So it's kind of a, it has a similar type of class. It's, you know, slightly different. So a, a trial, uh, some data just came out this year, really hot off the press, called the ELECT trial, showed kind of similar types of things. You know, if, if the patient uh, was on somatulene, they had, um, uh, you know, a pretty good response with treatments, you know, better than placebo. And, you know, some people didn't do better, but most of the times the, the people on the drug did better. And if you ask them how they did, so a little bit subjectively, definitely the majority of them felt they were doing better overall. So there's no question that it helps. It, it's this, the trials are a little bit different, and you know, the, the, the analysis is a little bit different. But um, you get the sense that it helps them with symptoms as well. OK. So then the next question is, well, OK, what if I don't have symptoms, right? What if I'm taking it for tumor control? So there are actually a couple of good, interesting trials to look at that. So the Germans looked at this a few years ago, and they said, well, what happens if you give atriotide for um, small intestinal neuroendocrine tumors that's metastatic? And they found this is a Kaplan-Meier curve, basically. So anything to the, that slopes down and fast is worse. So left is worse, right is better, OK? And if you were on placebo, your disease just kind of plodded along and got worse, OK? If you were on the sandostatin, 30 milligrams, you can see the patients did better. Their disease was slowed down, and it grew not quite as fast. So that was definitely like the first big hint that sandostatin or somatostatin analogs um, would help with even tumor control. Almost, almost, not quite, but like a kind of like a chemotherapeutic agent we think of. Okay. And then you know they piggybacked off that, and the lanreotide uh, group did the same thing. 
and they found a similar type of thing. They found that if you were on placebo, your disease would just slowly plod along and it would get worse, right? So left is worse, right? Or bottom is worse. Or, you know. And then if you were on the drug, you did better, okay? So that's kind of how it is. So now somatostatin analogs are well recognized, and we've known this for a long time, but it are now well recognized by the general population and the FDA and all the governments that in fact it is a, it is a good tool for controlling tumor growth, mostly for very slow growing tumors, which luckily our neuroendocrine tumors are, all right? So you can tell the tumors to be quiet. Now what does the FDA tell us? Well, the FDA says, well, they're a little bit different. So here in the US, the indication for sandostatin specifically is just for symptoms. That's what they got their indication for many, many years ago. So it's for the symptoms of diarrhea and flushing from carcinoid syndrome or from this very rare tumor called a VIPoma, which is a lot of diarrhea. But when uh, lanreotide came out, they had a slightly broader indication from the FDA. They said you can treat unresectable, well, or moderately differentiated, functional, non-functional, whatever, you know, advanced, metastatic, whatever you want, digestive, neuroendocrine tumors, and this is to improve progression-free survival, so to slow down the growth of your tumors, right? So we've expanded a little bit. So they're, they're a little bit different, but I should mention that sandostatin actually has an indication for tumor control in 68 other countries, right? So kind of, you know, legally speaking, you know, you can't give it, but medically speaking, it's still quite effective. So, you know, just understand that. Now, what does the NCCN say? So what happens when these, like, really super-powered, um, um, you know, oncologists get together and talk? Uh, it's a lot less fun than you think. But they talk, and they come up with these plans, and this is what they tell us to do, okay? And luckily, so this is the plan for taking care of GI, lung, and thymus carcinoid tumors, right, or neuroendocrine tumors from there. And the good thing, as you can see here, octreotide and lanreotide are right dab smacked in the treatment plan. It is true in local disease or, you know, primary disease. It is true in metastatic disease. And it is true in pancreatic disease, okay? So you have, so the NCCN definitely recognizes the role of both the medications in the treatment of the tumors, symptomatic or no, okay? So now if you put them head to head, how do you kind of figure these things out? So that's a little bit more challenging, right? So if you look at sandostatin in the preparation, it has these polymers, okay, so it's a little bit different. In somatuline, it has this crystal in water. That's all it is, it's, it's, it's water. That's how they make it. So sandostatin does have some more additives in it so it can kind of polymerize and hold it in place so it's long acting. And then like I said, somatuline is dissolved in water. Sandostatin is a little bit harder to mix, okay? And this has actually been an issue for many, many years. So when you mix it, or the, when the nurse mixes it or the pharmacist mixes it, they have to shake it, all right? There's a new formulation that came out about a year ago. And the problem is the, the shaking has been totally contrary to nursing culture for 20 years, all right? So if you're getting sandostatin and you're not sure the nurse knows how to do it, just ask them, are you shaking it up? Right? It's literally like this. There's a video on sandostatin.com, so make sure they're mixing it right. Otherwise, you're not getting the drug. Right? In the past, you had to very gently swirl it, and thousands and thousands of nurses were taught, you can't shake it. And then all of a sudden, they, they changed it you know, to make it easier for them. But now you're fighting all this nursing culture. You know? So that's the thing. Somatuline is a little bit easier. It comes as a prepackaged uh, uh, envelope, essentially. You kind of open the thing up, you rip it, and you stick it. It's a, it's a lot easier. Uh, a little tip I learned from Dr. Waltering, if you're going to get somatuline, you should warm the thing up. It goes down much, much easier. It's like giving hair gel, okay? So it goes down easier if it's warmed up, so warm it up. The sandostatin comes as a 20-gauge needle, so it's a little bit, tiny bit smaller than the somatuline 19-gauge. The sandostatin has to be given into the big muscle in your bottom because that's where it's best absorbed. If it goes in the fat, you'll feel this little bump in this nodule there for a month, right? Yeah, I see a lot of nodding heads. Yeah, yeah. Somatuline goes into the deep sub Q. What does that mean? It goes kind of like, I don't want you rubbing on it, okay? So it has to go a little bit deeper into the fat so that it can sit nicely, okay? If it's given in the muscle, it's okay. If it's given in the fat, it's okay. It's a little bit more forgiving in that way, okay? Both drugs ideally should be given in a healthcare professional's office. That's what's recommended, 
um, but there are you know, ways around that. And both of them have a kind of a home administration program that you should investigate. Uh, because sometimes it's easier to have it at home than to, to go to, a, you know, I live in Colorado, so it, it, it's not, there's a lot of like rural areas. So sometimes it's not so easy for them to drive three hours through the mountains and the snow to come see me. How about dosing? So I wish it was so simple. So the recommended dosing for, uh, so the recommended, the, the doses for sanosatin come as 10, 20, and 30 milligrams, okay? The doses for somatinine are 60, 90, and 120. And a lot of these things were worked out for many other diseases too. In fact, these drugs are not new. They mostly are given by our endocrinology colleagues, right? So Dr. Odo's really been working on it for a long time in many different ways, like acromegaly and kind of pituitary type of stuff. But the recommended starting dose for Sando is about 20 milligrams. And they do that because then you can go up or down, depending on how you feel. The recommended dose for tumor control for somatinine is 120 milligrams. And the reason they did that was because their trial was 120 milligrams. And in the trial, they wanted to give you a you know, big bang of, of drug to see if we can really improve it. Now, the only problem is it seems in intuitive and easy to say, oh, well, clearly 10 correlates to 60 and 20 correlates to 90 and 30 correlates to 120. Well, that is frankly just unfortunately not true. So you kind of have to work with the person, get to see how they feel. Maybe the somatoline is too strong, you know, and they have more symptoms. Maybe the sandostatin is hard to give because of their body habitus. So the, it, it's always good to have more options to think about. And how about financial support, which is very, very important, right? And I gotta say, I'm very uh, honored and delighted to work with both Novartis and Ipsen because they are very conscious. I'm sure they're, they're big businesses, I know. But they are very, very conscious of wanting to help patients because they know they, are, they have a medication that helps people a lot. And so they have a, both have very supportive uh, programs for helping with co-pays. And, and they know it's expensive, and so they try to help as much as possible. So unless you have, you know, unfortunately, the Medicare, which is really the problem, but if you have commercial insurance, you should always call the company to see if they can help you with those co-pays. It's very good. In fact, I know, for example, so Matchling Depot offers like $20,000 per year in assistance with your co-pay. So definitely call, definitely call. And they're, they're wonderful, sweet people. Anything else? So I told you you have the dotatate, which is new, right? So that is mostly for the gallium scan and the, and the PRT that's probably coming out. There's the dotatoc available, which is uh, not commercially available, but, but the odoricios are working with that with the yttrium. And then there's this other next generation called pasareotide or signifor. It's a Novartis drug. It's actually super interesting as well. And basically what it is, instead of just binding to two and five, essentially, it binds now to one, two, three, and five. So maybe it gives you kind of a little bit of a better spread and a better coverage. I, it's, I wish it was that simple, but, but it's, in theory, it's actually pretty nice. It's approved for Cushing's disease, so an endocrine disease, not for neuroendocrine. And, uh, and Dr. Wallen, in fact, has studied it quite a lot, and uh, he published a... Uh, an article looking at it saying that it did seem to kind of help with tumor control a little bit. It wasn't perfect for symptoms, and so octreotide is still kind of our go-to drug, but hopefully we can still continue to study and hopefully find a way to, um, to continue to help with their some patient symptoms. So how do you choose? What do I choose, right? I mean, gosh, she is pretty, and she has been around for a long time, and she still looks good, let me tell you, right? So Sandistat has 25 years of experience. Every oncologist is familiar with it, right? But if you're gonna get it, make sure you shake it up. Just shake it up, just shake it up, shake it up, right? But wow, isn't she younger and cuter, right? So it's, so Matchling is kind of a new product. It's a little bit easier formulation, maybe a little easier administration. So it's definitely something to consider. The most important thing is that you have options. Options, my friend. I'm waiting for the people to explain the joke. <laughs> okay, so let me tell you a little bit about me. So I'm Eric Liu, I am a, I'm a surgeon by training, but I kind of fancy myself a little neuroendocrinologist. I trained in Sweden, and so I, I think of it in a slightly different way, kind of a little European. Um, and uh, we work at Rocky Mountain Cancer Center in Denver. Uh, we have a little clinic, which we call the Neuroendocrine Institute, which is basically me and my buddies. Uh, this is our clinic. You, you should probably approach it by plane. <laughs> Don't have Dr. Warner fly the plane, though. 
So this is, how, so this is my patient, James B. For, it, for privacy, okay? That's, it's right up there. That is a bag full of somatostatin analog. I just can't tell you which one. So I have my buddy, Dr. Charlie Nutting, he's an interventional radiologist, he's on the far right. Alan Cohn is my medical oncology friend and we see a lot of neuroendocrine patients and we do tumor board and stuff like that. It's actually really great, it's a lot of fun. Um, let me just do a little plug for our foundation, the Healing Net Foundation. A lot of you have probably already met Cindy Lovelace in our table in, in Terrence. We have a table outside. We are a foundation we created to kind of fill in the blanks. You know, neuroendocrine patients need a lot of uh, uh, help because there are many, many other kind of cancers and diseases out there. And so we're fighting for you guys to, to help with advocacy and education. You know, we have a website. We have a Facebook page. We do a lot of things. Uh, we had a, a, an interesting summit bringing a lot of experts together to talk about the topic of neuroendocrine and, and what are some of the challenges which you guys are hearing about these next two days. For anyone who knows my friend Gary Murfin, he's, a, he's one of the neuroendocrine puppeteers around the country. He helps guide people. He's a great advisor. And he's on our board and a wonderful resource. If anyone's interested, we wrote a little primer. It's kind of a little, you know, I wrote it kind of for docs, a really a digestible form of neuroendocrine. And we have it outside, so please feel free to get it, I know. And these are all the people who, I, I can't do this alone, so these are all the people that helped me and kind of, and I want to thank Cindy for her, her support always, and I want to thank the Wayman family for just doing all this all the time. They are great. And that's it. That's all I have.